Uh, it's, it's a pleasure to get this uh, webinar launched. This is the first of three webinars that will uh, address our topics. I'll be going a bit more into that. Uh, my name is Larry Reagan. I'm honored to be your moderator for today's program. This is the first in the future, the future substance of STEM education project. We call it the future of STEM on our project team. And I'm pleased to represent uh, our PIs, Punya Mishra and uh, Ariel Ambar, and give a wave. So they'll be on screen. Uh, and one of the things we thought we would do is uh, play a very brief introductory video to give you some uh, other names and a little bit of the context of the project. So let's start with that, if you would, Punya. Yes, give me a second. Okay. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes. Recent events demonstrate that we live in a volatile, uncertain, complex, and ambiguous world. Navigating this landscape, whether it be climate change or the current COVID-19 crisis, requires significant knowledge of science, technology, engineering, and mathematics, what we call the STEM disciplines. But STEM is not enough. We won't be able to manage these unprecedented challenges or the opportunities they create unless we dissolve the traditional silos between scientific knowledge, essential skills, and human values. We believe that succeeding in this new emerging world requires new forms of knowledge and new approaches to learning. Our students will need to go beyond merely learning STEM content. They will need to develop skills of creativity and ingenuity and the ability to work with others collaboratively. And as importantly, they will need to understand the broader social and ethical context within which we live and work. Our standard curriculum in STEM often pays lip service to these broader issues. We suggest that future STEM programs must embrace the challenge of integrating what we are calling humanistic knowledge and meta-knowledge alongside traditional foundational knowledge. And this must be done in a way that broadens participation in STEM so that we create a diverse workforce that can meet the challenges of the future. So the goal of this project, and it's a big one, is to design the future substance of STEM education. In the upcoming webinars and workshop, we will both develop a richer understanding of these issues, as well as engage in designing and creating programs that change how we see the content of STEM learning. Through this, we will create exemplars for how these ideas can become reality in the future. These exemplars are models of programs that fully integrate learning in the STEM disciplines with the ethical, humanistic, and social aspects of learning required by our complex world are central to our work. Working together in teams to build these models will allow us to more fully explore our ideas and to communicate these ideas as higher education undergoes once in a lifetime change in the next decade. So to jumpstart this process, we've made a series of webinars. These will serve as precursors to the workshop. We're really excited to have you along with us for the journey. We're looking forward to your input. You can find more information about this project at stem-futures.org. So let's get started. Thank you, Bunya. There we go, terrific. So hopefully that gave you uh, a little bit of a framing of the, of the project. And um, as uh, several folks indicated in that video, we're gonna be looking uh, at these topics as these issues roughly framed around this sort of knowledge structure concept. And uh, each, in each of the webinars, we're gonna have two guests to, who will help us sort of explore some of those concepts a little bit deeper and we wanna have a dialogue with you. So that leads me to some housekeeping details. You'll notice that the chat line is open, it's up, <coughs> excuse me. We would like to encourage you to use that as a way to dialogue and communicate amongst your, your participants. Uh, we will have one of our team members who'll be tracking that and responding if there are thoughts or comments that come up there that need to be relayed back to the webinar panelists, we'll certainly do that. But that is really intended for you to, to maybe use as a stream of consciousness or to have dialogue with other participants. We also have the Q&A tool available. Uh, Ariel will be managing that. He'll be watching for questions that might come in. 
making sure that he's going to be able to bring those to me so that I can get them to our panelists. So we have the, those two ways for you to interact. And I'm going to mention to you now, I don't want to mention, I don't want to forget in the end, you'll also be getting a survey at the end of the webinar. Uh, I'm sorry, follow up to the webinar that will ask you um, to take to give us some feedback on how this program served and met your needs. So with that, let's get, we've got two marvelous guests today. Very excited uh, to have with us uh, Katina Michaels and Richard Pitt. Uh, and so let me just talk about Katina for a moment. This is a long title, Katina. So stay, stay in there with me. But Katina is a professor in School of the Future of Innovation in Society and School of Computing, Informatics and Decision System Engineering at Arizona State University. Marvelous to have you with us. I know you traveled a great deal to get here this morning. Katina is in Australia at this time. So welcome. Thank you, Larry. My pleasure. Uh, Katina's research domain is wide and varied, and she really examines fascinating areas of the social implications, the ethical dynamics, and policy development at the intersection of the human body and technology. Uh, we're very much looking forward to her observations of, of this intersection and what it may mean for us as we move forward with STEM, uh, STEM education. Also join, joining us today is Dr. Richard Pitt. Uh, Richard is at UC San Diego. He's an associate professor of sociology and his research energy goes toward looking at the intersection of race, identity and culture that can create barriers in STEM education. His work includes examining the construction and maintenance of social identity, particularly the intersection of social group identities gender, race, sexuality, and religious, academic, and professional identities. Thank you both for being here. I think the combination of, of the lens that you both are approaching this uh, will be very interesting and helpful for us today. So uh, I wanted to start off, uh, Katina, perhaps inviting you to share a little bit of your background. I've looked into your background, which is fascinating, but I'm wondering if you can share a bit with our audience of, of what research you do conduct. So uh, I'm a telecommunications engineer by training and employment uh, that began around the mid nineties. Uh, and today I take that knowledge and I explore transdisciplinary areas of expertise. So unintended consequences of technology. Uh, will technology sort of uh, influence the trajectory of society as a whole? Will society become technology? Look at Neuralink discoveries. Uh, and so what I'm looking at is this intersection, this transdisciplinary sort of uh, field, and really utilizing what I would call non-traditional, unorthodox uh, approaches to research. So I look at the biomedical sphere, for example, uh, but beyond that also much broader, what does it mean to be human? Uh, the who-ness aspect, as Michael Eldred, say, Eldred says, and also the what-ness, what are we? <laughs> you know? So these deep philosophical questions from the very much detailed engineering layout right to the top, Larry. So uh, thank you, Katina. I, I think as I was looking at uh, some of your videos and reading some of your materials, what fascinated me was that the consideration of how these dynamics interact and what we need to be thinking about. So some of the questions I'm going to come, not right now, but in, in a moment is going to be exploring a little bit about how that uh, that lens may influence what we need to be preparing our students for. So hold that thought. Thank you, Katina. Uh, Richard, if I can go to you and ask you for a little bit of uh, background on your area, which is kind of related to Katina, but has a different focus around this idea of group identity. And I think self-identity is embedded in there as well. You're on mute. No. Thanks, Larry. Um, so it's exciting to be part of this conversation because sociology, my discipline, had a similar conversation a couple years ago with the Social Science Research Council. And what we discovered in our conversations was that we are drowning in the humanistic stuff. Like that's what we do in sociology, right? We talk about justice and equity and diversity and inclusion and those kinds of things. 
but we struggle with trying to figure out like what the foundational knowledge is, what is the content knowledge we have to do when we're teaching sociology. But as a sociologist who studies STEM, we bump into, me and my team certainly bump into often this, you know, I'm gonna call it a problem because it feels like a problem. Uh, these sort of cultural logics in science disciplines, these institutional logics in science spaces that are inclined to ignore humanistic ideas, things like things that I care about, like identity and affect, uh, culture, group processes, in spite of the fact that those things shape our decisions to be scientists, they shape what we find interesting to study, they shape what we find interesting to read, um, and probably most importantly for people who um, are coming up in these disciplines as trainees um, and future colleagues and people trying to be tenured, uh, these cultural logics and these institutional logics uh, ignore the humanism that's involved in um, what we value as science and who we value as a scientist. Mm -hmm. So, you know, it's, we feel, certainly my research team, that if we can think more deeply about how to get science education, science spaces to move beyond, or maybe not, move beyond this sort of um, we are beyond or above values attitude, right, where everything is this means and rationality uh, approach that, that, you know, where we ask the question, well, what are the ends here and how do we meet them? And things like justice and equity, diversity, inclusion, or human categories like uh, identity and affect, culture and process, group process, people are like, why do I need to know that? What does that have to do with meeting science ends? Where, of course, I think uh, we don't recognize that uh, the value of certain kinds of ends, for example, knowledge, is governed by value. So it really becomes important, we argue, to think about values in science and not just focus our attentions on content knowledge and critical thinking skills and ignore uh, the fact that values shape all of those things. So what's really interesting, I think, about the point you're raising is that we have a sensitivity right now in particular about the issues of race, culture, identity, and so forth. And um, I'm just wondering, uh, Richard, have we over, um, over hyped that dimension right now, but we've not addressed it historically in our educational system? I guess what I'm asking is, have we actually removed it too much? Like issue of value, for example, is never gonna go away how, what do we do with that as we begin preparing new curriculum for students to, to be effective in their world? Yeah, I, I feel like we argue that it needs to be front stage, hmm. right? It becomes an assumed thing. People know why they're here. This is what we think. People know why they're here. People have their values as they are uh, doing their work. But what we, we think really becomes important is that we need to put these things on the front stage, right? We hmm. need to actually address them in the curriculum, address them in the classroom, and not make assumptions that everybody's on the same page. Even in sociology and psychology, we assume everybody's on the same page, right? Sociology, we care about these things. We assume we're all, and certainly our students do, assume we're all wacky commie liberals uh, who are trying to uh, turn our students into socialists. Um, but again, once you get when, when you unpack those things in the classroom, you find out very quickly that uh, these are complex ideas that need to be addressed in real ways. And I love that this moment that we're in uh, probably is calling people to open their eyes a little bit differently. But you can imagine that we'll move past this moment very quickly. And if people do not codify these conversations in curricula, the moment will pass and we'll all just go back to our corners and students will uh, not learn in STEM classes um, the kinds of things that we need them to learn to be ethical scientists, to be uh, scientists who think about the people around them in the context that um, affect their work and will be affected by their work. So Richard, I I'm just curious, do you, do you ever see a value neutral environment? Is that what 
is that what the environment you're suggesting? Let's get to the point where there are because that and and Katina, I'm curious. Your your domain is also value laden, right? Value value based. And I'm still struggling with how do we wrestle with that? Is we're going to be asking our participants to go out and uh, their projects are going to be developing, you know, uh, curriculum maps, curriculum plans for these various um, projects they'll be working on. How do values fit into that? Because we all bring values to the table, I think. Go ahead, Katina. Well, thank you. Um, that was just a beautiful introduction there, I might say. Um, I would just like to add that uh, we all have different uh, values that are created by different environments and different markets and different economic systems. You know, they're not homogenous. Mm -hmm. Communities are not one. It's not the old telecommunications model that says build and they will come. It's one. And don't worry about asking anyone what they think. We just know what we're going to do because we're going to make this much money from it. Mm -hmm. It's not a business case is not driven by economics is driven by humanity and we are disconnected at the moment from the person we are looking still at this industrial revolution model that says it's the masses mm -hmm. well yes we need to cater to the needs of the masses but in the masses are communities of interest communities of practice that need to be uh, unpacked and unlocked and allowed to breathe and at the moment, we see it as homogenous. Markets are homogenous. You know, we talk about the market in China and the market in America and the market in Africa and Europe. You know, that's how I develop skills or the wireless market or the wireline broadband market when I was in telecoms 25 years ago. And we still think that mentality is going to work in the 21st and 22nd centuries. It's not because we can have shared values. You know, you shall not kill. You know, you shall not starve yourself to death. These are, these are common, innate, inherent qualities in human beings. Mm -hmm. But then when we say this technology should work this way, well, it'll be different to the First Nations person in Canada, to the Indian in, uh, in country. You know, we've, we've, we think that nation is country. We disassociate and we, we, we put political labels on things when in fact we've lost touch with the here. Where am I? I'm currently situated in a local place. It's called Jeringong. It's an Aboriginal name. Jeringong, New South Wales in Australia. But what about the people that inhabit Jeringong? What are their current cares? Well, I can tell you what their current care is. It's suicide. It's the prevention of young people as victims of suicide. The town has painted itself yellow at the moment mm. in acknowledgement of the five deaths that have occurred in the last 10 weeks. And so that's the need of the city and the little town, my two and a half thousand person town. It's not what's happening overseas in a different market. And so technologies got to respond to needs. If we are saying user centered, if we are saying person centered as methodology, then we've got to live up to that. We've actually got to talk to somebody, not a marketing survey where you ring up or you, you trace somebody's internet cookies. That's not what I'm talking about. I'm talking about real problem identification, real challenges that are local challenges. And sometimes, yeah, they could be uh, scalable internationally. They may not be. But we also want communities driving their own solutions. We don't want to be wearing the hat that says, I'm waving the flag of the values that I impose on you. That's colonial, colonialism. Mm -hmm. What we want is to empower the communities to build for themselves. That's what we need. And so that's where I talk about values, Richard, and, and that's really been ignited by your opening comments. Mm. Well, well, that's often the funny part of this, right, is that I think we compartmentalize, right? I teach college students, undergrad college, college students, um, and, you know, occasionally a science student or two will wander into one of my classes um, and, and often wander into my classes uh, in a very reduced opportunity way because of the structure of the STEM curriculum that sort of drives them to take this many classes and there's very little opportunity sometimes to take the humanistic kinds of courses, right? They get to take a perspectives course as part of gen ed, right? They have to take a, a arts course as part of gen ed, but there's very little opportunity outside of the actual gen ed requirements to go any deeper into things that, again, will cause them to challenge 
their own sort of values that they bring to campus from home, their values around science and what should happen in science spaces. There's just little opportunity for them to have that exposure just because of the structure of STEM education outside of the curriculum that uh, you folks will be developing. And so, you know, we often argue that science majors should uh, all be encouraged to consider a second major or a minor in the arts and humanities because, again, not only do we find that the general average science major is not getting this stuff in their coursework, um, because they are now double majoring, 25% of students are now double majoring, many of them at uh, selective schools, uh, the people who double major in two STEM disciplines, they take virtually no social science. So they don't wander into sociology classes at all. And even their humanities and arts courses aren't giving them exposure to ethics and emotions and identity and culture. And what students aren't capable of doing um, is applying the knowledge that they might take in my sociology of the family course or my sociology of race course or my sociology of religion course or my sociology of gender course. They aren't capable of taking that knowledge and then when they're sitting in their organic chemistry course, applying what they learned in my class to that context so that they can sort of think about, oh, well, how is gender structuring what I'm hearing in the organic chemistry class? How is race structuring what I'm hearing in the organic chemistry class? It becomes very compartmentalized because the message they hear from me in sociology are not being echoed in organic chemistry, are not being echoed in calculus, are not being echoed even in civil engineering, where again, you're talking about spaces that people live in and engineering those spaces, the students who we interviewed who do civil engineering argue they don't encounter these conversations even in an engineering discipline that is not talking about rocks and physics and uh, mechanical things, but is actually talked about the lived in and inhabited space. It's, it's astounding to me sometimes. Boy, this is a, <laughs> a lot of different directions to go here, but let me, <laughs> Let me address a, a, a comment you made, Richard, and then Katina, I'd like to get your insights on this as well. One of the things this project is attempting to do is to look at the integration of these experiences of the, of the humanistic, and, and we'll be talking about the meta, uh, how we learn stuff later. Um, and instead of, are there alternatives to, to the model of having students take, as you said, Richard, you know, my, my uh, science curriculum over here and then my sociology curriculum over here. What are the opportunities as we're starting to think out, project out about writing these curriculum models in maps? What are the opportunities that these things get better integrated? So when I'm taking my organic chemistry and I'm learning about, I don't know, pollutants or, or whatever it is, I'm also bringing in topics of society and um, and privilege and so forth, because it's all intertwined. Katina, if you don't mind, I, I might start with you and then go to Richard. Uh, yes, I have so many ideas. I mean, great opportunities. The school I'm part of uh, has about nine joint hires. So we live in two schools uh, uh, and also have more workload, I, I, I perceive uh, as a result, but it gives us a footprint into two different places. It allows us to bring students from cross disciplines together into courses. I'm teaching one course right after this uh, call uh, that is a smart city infrastructure and technology. And we have engineering students and social science students. And in fact, even architectural, one religious student who's joined us. And what's happening is incredible. It's a fluency. And it's not the social scientists teaching the engineers. It's also the engineers going, hey, social scientists, we, we care about the future. This is how we think about it. So there are wonderful opportunities in joint hires. There are wonderful opportunities in bringing students from across curriculums, across disciplines, but that requires a lot of hard earned work in convincing chairs to accredit basically uh, the courses that you're offering that are cross disciplinary. Um, there's a lot of opportunity for public interest technology, which is a new America foundation uh, trajectory. You know, what is the public interest and what is this thing? You know, we have public interest law, public interest journalism. What's this public interest technology? Why should large firms like IBM and Intel actually care about 
it. And so we've created a curriculum in a Masters of Science, which is there to embrace people from all the way from NGOs right through to private enterprise. I've got people pinging me from across sector industries, from uh, large transnational corporations, you'd be shocked, uh, who are wanting to learn about responsible innovation. Then there are institutes like the IEEE, the Institute of Electronics and Electrical Engineers, that have a society dedicated to the social implications of technology. Mm. There are opportunities uh, to bring ethics and society issues within all courses, not just a single mm -hmm. course that ticks the box for ABIT, uh, that accreditation body uh, in the US or the Australian Computer Society or the British Computer Society. Uh, there are opportunities, as Richard said, to bring in diverse students who by their own trajectory and volition will bring in these issues and will raise their hand and say, but what about social justice? What about, about child impact? What about the environmental justice? What about risk? What about privacy and security by design? And the more people at the table, the more there can be a constructive dialogue. So I want people to think about the macro level, okay, international governance structures, international ethics um, approaches, uh, approaches on the, for example, the governance of artificial intelligence, which are being led by people like Wendell Wallach and Gary Martin at, at ASU. Then at the meso level, where a lot of hard work is happening uh, at the institute level where people are saying, look, we need to do ethics in action, value-based alignment in the development and construction of technologies. And at the micro level, it's about us figuring out as humans what our values are, okay? It's gone are the days where everyone believed in the Ten Commandments. And so what's the, what are our new commandments? You know, if that's not our shared understanding today, what are our shared values? Because what I don't want to happen is that People grow up maybe as, as uh, belief systems influenced maybe by Buddhism, uh, Hinduism, uh, even uh, spiritual practices in uh, Aboriginal communities, and then they get to work and they think I've got my first job. You know, I'm one of these underrepresented minority students who have made it. I've, I've cracked this poverty cycle and I've made it through and I've been given scholarships and I've taken them and I've done great. I don't want them to take off their jacket when they go to work and they go, you know what, when I turn up, this is, this is me, I'm gonna just hang it up and now I'm gonna somebody else. And this is the inner conflict of the human that as we go through these hard curriculums, we stop writing poetry, we stop becoming elaborate and expressive. Why? Why aren't we encouraging expression, encouraging actually the mixing of different perspectives as if, what are we scared of? And, and this is where a lot of education has to happen to the accreditation bodies as well. They do want to go forward with social and ethical value systems. They do want to see it embedded in the curriculum, but they need ideas from us. And then we need to go back to them and say, now take it seriously. If they do not meet these standards or these uh, things that we've, we've put forward, then don't accredit them. You know, come on hard. Prove that you actually espouse issues of gender, issues of underrepresented minority, issues of whatever. But this is a great opportunity for us to influence the gatekeepers, perhaps at the school level, who have control of the curriculum. It's, an, it's, it's there to challenge our, our general computing uh, professionals who are teaching, who say, ethics, what's that got to do with me? It has nothing to do with me. Or I'm going to give ethics uh, zero credit points because they just have to do it. Don't worry if they don't turn up and don't worry if they don't try hard. That attitude has to go out the window. Actually, ethics is the most important part of all of this, I feel, because otherwise we don't even know what we're building and why we're building and where we're going. So these are just some thoughts. Mm. Terrific. Thank you. Thank My you response for is amen. <laughs> amen. So, so Richard, yeah, that's very, very well said. There's a lot there. What I got out of that was it was a list of, of, um, techniques and strategies and Richard I didn't know if there was anything on there that you wanted to to build upon um, Katina mentioned multiple methods of this sort of this integrating views and thoughts and perspectives of, um, of the humanistic dimension into into the, the sciences any any others I, I just want to give you an opportunity to respond to that <laughs> I agree with all of it um... I, I, one thing that, that I like about sort of the various uh, approaches to doing this that 
Patina was just talking about is that it becomes a, pro a generational dynamic, right? If, if people start putting these things and seeding to some degree, you know, you can't shove it into the curriculum, but certainly seed the curriculum with these ideas, then undergraduate uh, STEM majors will start to be like, will start to hear them, start to value them, start to make the important connections we're talking about. Mm -hmm. and, and undergraduate STEM majors become graduate students in STEM, mm -hmm. which means if in graduate education, where we have more control over what people are taking um, as part of our curriculum, what we do is we then require them to take a course, team taught initially by a social scientist or a humanist, but uh, eventually, you know, there are, I can't see the, the number here. There are a number of people in this webinar right now who care about these issues, who are not uh, people who are like, I don't understand. Please just tell me what we're talking about entirely when we're talking about humanist uh, dynamics and humanistic knowledge, right? There are people in this space who care about this and have lots of knowledge in these areas. It is about freeing them to do that in graduate training. Uh, so that the people who will eventually become faculty aren't recreating any wheels when they're trying to do this and in their undergraduate classes and in their graduate classes. So it becomes generational where we teach it to undergrads, undergrads eventually become graduate students and faculty who then teach it to undergrads who become, and then we don't have to do this like, oh, how can we sneak it into the curriculum, right? It becomes normative and sociology we, like every discipline, have our dead white men. And it's always been Marx, and it's always been Durkheim, and it's always been Weber. But people have said, hey, what about Du Bois, for example? And there are a whole bunch of people who throw up their hands and say, I don't know anything about Du Bois. But then some people were saying, I guess I'll learn a little bit about Du Bois. And once we teach Du Bois in our undergrad classes and our graduate classes, now we're in a situation where everybody has Du Bois mm -hmm. in their curriculum, right? Their uh, uh, theory courses, et cetera, right? And so I think what it takes is the kind of people who are in this webinar saying, I care about these issues and I'm gonna be the first person to include this stuff in my classes, mm -hmm. which means students will hear it and value it and move on into higher spaces to become again, the next generation to do it at a higher level than we do it, who will then be in turn uh, producing the next generation who will do it at even higher levels. Mm -hmm. So everything we're talking about is not, oh, let's bring in some experts and we'll do this for the rest of eternity, right? It is, if we start doing it now, three generations of science from now, it'll be normative, it'll be the cultural logic, it'll be the institutional logic, um, you know, based on just sort of how isomorphic pressures work. If we have to do as Katina is saying and have the accreditation organizations coerce us to act like we're supposed to act, that's fine. But I would argue that when Harvard and Yale and Princeton start incorporating this into their STEM training, the medic and normative isomorphic pressures will flow and the rest of us will magically find it more valuable, will magically find it easier to do uh, either because, again, the people who we take our lead from as institutions have shown that it is valued, the rest of us will fall in line. It's, it's like magic, um, but it's not like magic. It is human nature. It is organizational nature. We just have to, you know, take this thing that we care about and do with it the same way we've done other things we cared about in science. You know, it, it strikes me, and this is maybe not a great analogy, but I'm just thinking if if you've got a plant that is that is uh, you know having difficulties, we can either spray the the top of the plants and and kill whatever the bugs, or we can put the material into the soil and make it systemic. That's right. And and in in from from what you're both saying, it, we need to be turning our attention to the systemic methods of integrating these tech, these uh, topics together rather, rather than just spraying the top of the leaves, which, which are eventually gonna drop off. And I, I, Richard, I love the idea that you're mentioning of, you know, once we begin, then that cycle, and it may not, it's not gonna be overnight. It's not gonna be five years, seven years, but over time, it's going to, to build. 
if if the two of you could sort of brainstorm with with me for a minute, um, what are the methods that you might suggest as our curriculum planners, our curriculum mappers will be doing here in a couple of weeks? What are some of the strategies that you might suggest they consider for for this process of bringing in you know the values based uh, understandings for for integrating the humanistic um, I'll, I'll seed it a little bit because i've been thinking of one as you've been talking and this is nothing new but you know the idea of two different two, two faculty members from two very different disciplines co-instructing a course not i think richard you were the one who mentioned not after i'm done my piece now you do your piece but we we sort of do it together has has that worked, Katina? I don't know if you've had experience with that kind of a model. And are there other ideas we can begin helping our audience write down strategies? Yes, Larry, I think that's a great idea. Uh, I have team taught, particularly in Australia. It's something that people do by default. Uh, mm -hmm. the, the curriculum is structured as such in case someone gets sick or in case uh, there is... Um, a need, a direct need for interdisciplinarity. Let's take a machine learning course, for example. It's a great opportunity to teach hardcore uh, machine learning, but also the ethics of doing that. Um, and having two people from two different disciplines to do that, or somebody who's versed in two disciplines coming in and teaching that is a wonderful opportunity. I would stress coming off what Richard said as defining this as an opportunity for problem-based learning, mm as opposed to mastery of skills, right? Mm. It's very much deliberate pedagogical approaches, different to outcomes-based learning. Mm -hmm. okay, yeah. But if you look at it from a problem-based learning perspective, it means whatever skill set you bring to the classroom, you can actually apply it to the same problem. Mm. And so I often think about the teaching research nexus. Mm. How is it that people really learn? You know, it is by talking to others. It is by um, experimenting with something. But when you bring people together in teams, cross-disciplinary teams, they are encouraged to talk in an ontology that actually they understand or they develop, they create a fluency. And so there's this cross-pollinization to continue the plant uh, notion. And what you want is that the problem-based learners are actually the trailblazers. They're exploring from their own hat, their own mindset, their own skin, their own understanding of the world around them. And they're not contained or straightjacketed to say, you must think using this framework. No, develop the framework. Here's the traditional frameworks we've used to do a problem identification or a requirements analysis, maybe in the software engineering process or the systems engineering process. Do you agree with the rubric? Mm -hmm. And if not, offer me another lens. What is that lens? What does it contain? And so I often think when students are encouraged to talk to real people, they create the ethics application, yes, at the undergraduate level. We've done it before. It works. And people own the problem. They own the, the, the case study. They own that thing that they are learning about. Uh, there's ownership there. And then they realize there's a responsibility there. Often we, we try to teach responsible innovation in a, in a vacuum that says, see this, that's responsible and that's not responsible. Well, you can watch a movie to, to, to understand that. And, and movies and science fiction have become very interesting. I've seen some paper-based research that's come out of saying it does work, it does uh, connect with students. But when the student is actively learning and participating in research, even at the undergraduate level, I feel that they come face to face with the real issues. And that's what I want. I want people to have a reality check We've got too many academics in academia that have never worked in industry, have never had exposure to real subjects, understood the ethics and care required. And so it's the ethics of uh, care for oneself, the ethics of care for one's uh, team, your, the group that you, you, you are in, the organization you're part of, the community, the countries, the space that you live in, uh, the subjects that you interview. You have a responsibility to yourself and all of these other entities. And so that's what I want. I want us to be grounded in the reality because often we're building for like, I don't know. I, I really don't know what's motivi mo motivating, motivating the invention. Yes, discovery is, you know, we've done studies, ethicists have done studies on this. I actually want us to invent and innovate for need, right? That's a totally different equation. 
what I love about that, and then uh, I see Ariel's come on here, so I'm going to give him an opportunity to insert a question, and I'll come back. Let's hear Ariel first. It's not about answering your question. I just want to let you know there's a lot of uh, Q and A showing up, questions showing up, so we should probably move to move to that model uh, in a minute, and then we can we can shift back and forth as as needed. Okay. Um, so, and I'd like to suggest to, to everybody, so uh, the way we'd like to do the q and I mean, if you have a question or a discussion point, put it in A, type it up. And if you'd like to actually, instead of me reading it, if you'd like instead for you to present your point, um, just raise your hand and I will, I will promote you to panelists and we can see and hear you. That'll be a little more personal. Now, can, I, can I follow up on what Katina was saying quickly before we move to Q&A? Yeah. Um, so I've also team taught courses. I've taught them with psychologists, and I think people would assume, hey, sociology and psychology, you know, they're really close to each other. They're, you know, that's just an overlap. And I think students were surprised, <laughs> especially in the course on gender, uh, when I taught as a sociologist about gender, and my colleague taught from a psychologist's perspective about gender, uh, just how different we were, but we came together in some common spaces. But the most important thing about both of the classes that I team taught, and this goes to Katina's real world piece of this conversation, is that uh, I and my two colleagues across these courses recognize that we are academics uh, yeah. primarily, right? Everything we know about everything is because we read it somewhere, not because we experienced it in real terms, whether it was my social entrepreneurship class or the class in gender where we were talking about gender and how gender operates in these spaces and in these ways that neither I nor my colleague knew. And so what we did was, uh, now again, wonderfully my institution uh, gave us the resource for this, but it doesn't take a lot of resources. We all understand Zoom now. People will do lots of things for free on Zoom when you don't have to bring them in uh, and put them in a hotel. What we did is every week, every other week, we brought in a real life person who is dealing with these things that we are trying to encourage our students to think about. Um, and those real life people then talked about the stuff that we said in class mm -hmm. and whether or not it would work in the real world, mm -hmm. right? And so I think one of the things that we could do to do this in a required course, not in the extra course that the interested people will take, but a required course is a team talk course uh, by two experts who are academics, but coming from different perspectives, which is also a resource to bring in people from industry, people from government, uh, people from non-for-profits, who are also wrestling with science in these same ways, thinking about how important it is to have a Black woman on their team, how important it is to think about uh, what poor people, how they will respond to you know, Facebook is hiring all these people who are thinking about, well, how do we get different kinds of people to in, uh, encounter what we're putting on the screen, right? Bringing the people in whose job it is to think about those things in industry, in government, in nonprofit science um, is useful because it shows students this is not just an ivory tower concern uh, by some, uh, you know, world changer scientists who were hired in the academy but these are actual things that people who work outside of the academy have to wrestle with in real ways. And therefore those things are important that these students are gonna one day be them and not us. Richard, that is a great link between a, a note I wrote down as Katina was talking about. She said, talk to the people, talk to that audience. And you just described a strategy, a method of doing that uh, where you're identifying the individuals, the potential client or the customer, whatever you want to call them, and bringing them into the experience to hear firsthand from them. I think that's marvelous. Um, Ariel, can we go to you? And I'm not yes. sure what the best method might be, but I'll leave that to you. So again, um, if you have a question, type it up. There are a lot of great questions typed up. And if you'd like to ask it in person, then raise your hand and we're going to model that. We have one person who's raised hand for that. Uh, I assume uh, Lisette Torres Gerald promote you to panelist. Be able to turn on your microphone and camera, and instead of me reading your question, you can just ask it. Let's see if this works. Lisette, you are on. You just need to unmute. Hi, thank you. Um, so I just appreciate what uh, Richard and Katina have shared. I'm a huge 
proponent of all of this. I've been pushing my um, STEM faculty at my institution to think about these things. And it, it's taken a few years, but I think there's a little bit of traction and some more open mindedness here. Um, I've experimented in the sense that we have a first year undergraduate seminar where it's open to whatever topic the faculty wants to do. So I've taken that as an opportunity to talk about science communication and engagement, but infusing social justice, power and privilege issues within that. Um, and it received a bunch of positive um, feedback from students. It's what they kind of want and what they're thinking about in terms of Yes, they want to do science, but I think a lot of them are also thinking about how they can impact their communities directly. Um, I think the challenge, though, is this mindset in STEM where, and uh, Katina, I think you mentioned this, this focus on content and mastery of content. And so when I talk to my colleagues about these issues, they're like, well, we don't have enough time or there's so much content we need to cover in order to and then they run the list off of you know they need this this and this in order to get into pre-professional school and so how can we do this without having to infuse uh create entire new courses uh, which i think is the challenge for some of my colleagues especially in smaller institutions where the funding and potentially the institutional support isn't exactly there. So my question is, do you have any suggestions? <laughs> Thank you, Lisa. Definitely. I think that's a great question and congratulations for starting that conversation in your faculty. And it does take years, but before you know it, <laughs> uh, these same academics who said, ethics is not my problem. And I, I invent, put their hands down and say, you know, I was approached the other day to say something and they asked me about ethics. And I said, of course they did. You know, you, you've created a swallowable camera capsule that takes endoscopic film of somebody's innards. There's an ethical issue here. And guess what? You can say a lot of positive things because people don't have to go under anesthesia. But the way to do it is exactly what you said. It's about integrating the, the, the foci. Let's call that social justice in your case. It's to embed it in the assessment. It's not to create additional courses or subjects or fields. It's to embed it in the question. And you know what I find? Mm. Our young people are so switched on. They are thinking different to our generation. Mm -hmm. And that's where I'm encouraged. That You just have to give them a bit of a nudge and then they shock you with what they come up with. Um, one of the examples we have in our uh, Consortium for Science Policy and Outcomes that we're members of is integrating every representation possible that we can with the resources that we have. For example, how do we get a homeless person to be part of a research project? Why is their voice important? You know, what about low socioeconomic challenges? How do we go about that? But it's, I think, underlying this, I wanted to say the word respect a thousand times during this conversation. It's respect. It's all about respecting people doesn't matter their context, doesn't matter how they self-identify, doesn't matter uh, whether they have millions or they have nothing. But everyone, everyone's voice, you know, our school's motto is the future is for everyone. I truly believe that in the social justice realm, but how do you embed this and then excite people? Because what I don't want is what has happened time and time again in the last six months, where I've had colleagues who do things like uh, uh, IT and social issues, right? Information technology. And they've said to me, you know what, Kat? I had 216 students. No one turned up to my class. They were too busy doing their C++ assignment because the rigor of that during COVID was so complex that they thought, I can't afford the time to go to that lecture. I'll download it later. Can you imagine how demoralizing that is for a lecturer to turn up and have zero because they've been told by the other faculty, that's not important. And we've got to stop this. Every academic is important. Every discipline is important. And soon, 
computing will be embedded everywhere. You know, we used to have e-business. Well, guess what, everyone? It's, it's business now. Computing is embedded in business. It's not i-business, e-business, whatever, c-business, m-business. It's business. Same with anthropology. And the big organizations have to step up and say, these sociologists, these anthropologists, we need them desperately in our companies, not just the STEM. And what we're seeing in Australia happen is that the cost of doing a non-STEM degree has almost doubled. And we're trying to funnel people into STEM. Well, that's not the only people we need. Yes, we need to integrate all of these people within STEM, but STEM is going to permeate across disciplines. It's called digital humanities. It exists today. There's digital theology. There's digital this and that. Well, soon we're going to drop the word digital. It's just going to be humanities again. But this is a critical conversation, and we are all at that, that, that moment. Yeah. <laughs> Some of it goes back to this, this thing that I said earlier about in science, we have this ethic around means ends. And what we have decided the ends are is only foundational knowledge. And if we have decided as a whole discipline, the only thing that matters is foundational knowledge, that's the end, then we focus on what means get us to those ends. I think some of the challenge of the folks in the room is to figure out how to make justice and, and uh, diversity and integration and identity and culture and group processes and cultural competencies a means to the science end, right? That's, that's the challenge, right? Is to not say, oh, this is another end that we're trying to get at. And so let's try to figure out some means to that end, right? Science is better when we think about the race of the people we're dealing with or the race of the people who will use our products, et cetera. Science is better if we think about the gender of the people who will use our products are the people who we are studying, right? As, as the vaccine companies are struggling today to figure out how to find subjects who are black and brown to make sure that they produce a better vaccine, right? If we had taught many of them that, well, black people do not trust science in the way white people <laughs> trust science. Like black people are not gonna take, given what happened to Tuskegee, black people are not gonna take your vaccine to see how this plays out, right? And, and that is not like mystery knowledge. That is knowledge that we certainly know in sociology classes, we certainly know in psychology classes, we certainly know in history classes, that can be taught in an introduction to biological methods course, mm. right? And so, so some of this, again, is not thinking about justice and ethics and other things are a different end and we have to figure out cool ways to get that stuff taught. We need to think about the end is good science. The end is ethical science. The end is comprehensive, diverse, um, integrated science. Um, and if we think of that as like what we need to get it at the end, then ultimately then people, smart people, right? Scientists are smart people, right? Then aim at trying to Figure out what the means are to that end. That is an end about science. It is not an end about justice as an isolated thing. It is not an end about equity, diversity, um, and inclusion as a separate end. It is the means to the end of better science. So I, I, I don't know that we need to sort of think about different ways I guess this is the, the challenge for you all, is thinking about different ways to help people recognize that these things that we're talking about are means to the same end that people are being promoted for, that people are getting jobs to pursue, et cetera, and not carve it out as a different end, right? As the sort of equity ethic, as opposed to uh, the science ethic. Wow, wow, okay. <laughs> Both, both of you gave me a, a list of, of topics. Uh, Mario, I know you got some more questions on there. Do you want there's to so many on? questions. But yeah, we should just have a whole day on this, right? And <laughs> totally, totally exhaust uh, Katina and Richard, unfortunately. Um, so uh, I'm going to go back. I'm going to go to the first question that's posted because it, it, it's germane to something that both of you just touched on. Um, and it's a question. It's from Jacqueline Kelly, and I'm going to torque it just a little bit, Jacqueline, if you'll forgive me. So the, the, what she posted was, interesting to me is that I want to be 
proficiencies in our graduates. So if that's what the industry really wants, why is the discipline still resistant to integrating these perspectives? And what, what I'd like to maybe torque that just a little bit is, so first of all, is that correct? Is that really what industry wants, right? From your perceptions, I, th I think it is based on what you said, but let's talk about that a little bit. And then um, the why is maybe interesting academically, but, but how do we bridge that, right? How do we maybe get departments to better understand what industry really wants, if that's indeed what industry really wants? Um, Richard, you've suggested a few strategies to bring guest speakers in, but more <laughs> systemically, what, what, what else can be so this industry academia gap? Yeah, so just like you said, right, industry says they want some things and it feels anecdotal. It's not anecdotal, right? Enough reports are going out, whether it is the fact that every industry leader, every industry organization in STEM from biomed to creation of dinosaurs is thinking about, um, is creating EDI offices. Right, is having people run around and talk about implicit bias and forcing people to take courses in implicit bias in every science organization in this country. Right, and so to pretend like, oh, you know, nobody cares about that stuff. Uh, all the organizations care about that stuff because they need people who, uh, once we, they work very hard at diversifying their workforce, they need people who you know, take advantage of that now we have a diverse and inclusive and equitable workforce without undoing it. And the reason why they want an equitable, diverse and inclusive workforce is again, because they believe it makes the science better, mm. right? And so I think we don't have to look very hard in the academy. We're just resistant to it um, because our accreditation organizations say content, content, foundational knowledge, content, foundational knowledge. Um, but again, we tell them what we plan to do and how we plan to do it. So even if they say uh, foundational knowledge, foundational knowledge, foundational knowledge, the task is for us to recognize that our students will go out into the world, Richard Aaron has shown this, that yes, the students have foundational knowledge, but when y'all talk about meta knowledge, students don't know how to learn and students don't know how to do critical thinking. And the students who don't know how to do critical thinking most are the science majors, right? because we focus on foundational knowledge and ignore that employers don't need people to know the very specific foundational knowledge that we obsess with. They need people to be able to think critically when there's a puzzle in science and then solve it in a creative and unique way. And in the same way, we can focus all of our attention on foundational knowledge, making sure that they know, I don't know enough actual science to, to even wander down this path, but how a widget fits with the widget ex exactly to get this outcome Again, if employers say, we will teach you that, if Facebook says, if Engine says, we will teach you some of the very specific foundational science knowledge because we are very specific in what we do here. But what we can't teach you is how to be a human being, an ethical, uh, smart, thoughtful human being in our space. They expect we're teaching that. Right, just like with everything, everything I learned, I learned in kindergarten, right? Employers don't, employers want kids, you know, employers want people who, who are thoughtful and know how to go to work and raise their hand to do, to speak in those kinds of things. That's not taught in the workplace. They expect that we're teaching that in school. And so in the same way that we recognize that employers want this, as evidenced by the things I said, we should include that as foundational knowledge. Thank you. Thanks, Richard. Ariel? Katina, well, Katina, did you want to comment on that briefly? Um, in the interest of time, we have to start being brief, but go for it. Very, very brief. Uh, beyond industry, right? Non-government organizations, not-for-profits, large-scale, small-scale businesses, government agencies, standards bodies. There's a complex value chain here that we need to unpack, and many of us don't understand who the stakeholders are to begin with. So industry, as Richard said, is vital. And I want industry to look beyond just the skilled engineers whom they believe know everything and can be turned salespeople, can be turned into something else like designers, something else like, you know, whatever it is at that front end. But in fact, they're letting themselves down. We had one employer come to visit us two years ago, hyping up these transnational opportunities. The social scientists in the room raised their hand. I'm graduating. Will you consider me? I'm a student of the Masters in Science and Technology Policy. I can offer this. 
The response was no, we'd rather you be an engineer than go into this social science space, which is an interesting you know, example of one company. Sorry, Ariel. No, that's, that's great. Um, so I, you know, there is this challenge of how do we systemically make this connection, right? Which I think is a, is a, is a vexing one. Um, I'm gonna pivot to a question. Uh, Michelle Kavark actually has her hand up, so I'm gonna let her ask it directly if she's willing to and if she's willing to, to make it pithy. Um, but it's a question I think a lot of people have, a lot of faculty have uh, when they are um, thinking about the charge. I think Richard, you were the one who said, uh, um, you know, just do it in your classroom. Just, just start doing it, right? Just if we all start marching down the path and that will make the change. So, so Michelle, did you wanna ask the very practical question that you have? Yeah, hi, thank you. Um, my question is about how as a chemist, I can responsibly raise some of these issues in the classroom. So I feel like my colleagues in sociology and the social sciences and humanities have the experience of being in graduate courses where they have these conversations about race and class and social justice. And I don't have experience with that outside my informal life. And I wanna make sure I'm doing this in a way that's responsible to my students. Thank you. Can you talk about ethics and then I'll talk about identity a little bit? That's a wonderful uh, segue, Richard. It's, it's the process that you're involved in. Um, and I think, I often think about little nuggets of information to begin with. And you might build on that year on year or every time you build, you, you run the class. So initially just maybe things that you say, it's, it's modeling behavior, appropriate behavior. It's, it's quite simple things that don't take a lot of effort. Um, emphasizing the importance of an IRB, emphasizing why you do um, this process uh, in terms of human subjects and also in your case, uh, possible animal research down the track. Uh, also give them a bit of an insight into the trajectory paths. I find that's very interesting when you talk about, you know, when you get into this role or when you do this down the track or when you get into ac academic research in your master's or your PhD, give them a vision of the possibilities and then connect with these things that you're talking about, even if they're personal experience, I actually find that's what the students are, are hungry for. What happened to you? What, when did you figure this out? Um, you know, I often talk to them about being turned inside out and they go, what's that? And I say, well, you know, when you're in a corporation and you're un developing an understanding of the world around you and then something just happens and you reflect, was that good or bad or should I have done that? That's a critical, you know, light bulb moment, but then, you, you are sometimes on the edge watching and observing in and observing out and then you're on the outer and you're observing the organization and its change. Um, so it's, it's telling them about what you feel, not being afraid that that's wayward, um, you know, obviously not hijacking a, an hour of three hours in a class to do that in a undergraduate chemistry, but it should be fundamental principles, I think, uh, and nuggets to begin with as you get more confident. Um, but I'm sure your classes are awesome. <laughs> That's what I'll say, because you're considering this. Hmm. Thanks. Yeah, Michelle, one of the, um, so thanks for the question. And I, you know, ditto what Katina said. You asked the question because I think you're a person who cares about it. So this is exciting, right? That's the first thing, right? To find chemists who care about doing it, right? Uh, so this, this is an issue, right? For any of us who care about diversifying, STEM, et cetera, right, is that we find that black and brown people and women uh, are running the biology, which is a science. So the conversation about, oh my God, nobody can do science. Well, they can, right? Uh, you know, they run to medicine. What? Medicine requires organic chem. Medicine requires biology and calculus, right? So they certainly are capable of doing science. The question is, why aren't they interested in pursuing a, a major in science or career in science. And again, it is specific science. It is chemistry, it is physics, it is math. The disciplines that argue that unlike biology, we aren't fooling with human beings. We're not fooling with animals and ethical anything, right? We're talking about rocks and we're talking about elements and we're talking about mathematical processes, which creates the challenge for people who care about this to go beyond their own experience. Again, it's not gonna be in your training, <laughs> right? To go beyond their experience and ask themselves and their colleagues and read the literature that explains why some women, why some black and brown students, why some indigenous people, 
by some working class folks who don't have parents who are engineers, have found their way into chemistry, physics, and math and persist. But what is it that they find in that space that they have latched on to? And, and I'm telling you, you know where to find it? Is people who, are, who graduate in these majors, chemistry, physics, math, from historically black colleges and universities, from Hispanic serving institutions, from Smith and from Spelman, right? Where these places are full of chemists and physicists and mathematicians who have figured out how to turn black and brown people onto chemistry, physics, and math, how to turn women onto chemistry, physics, and math, and engineering now at Smith, right? Those places, those people have had to work or else they would have no majors, right? And so instead of you or any of us who are working at very different institutions than those, right, struggling to recreate a wheel of how do we talk about these things in disciplines where they're not naturally there, like even biology or biomed, go to those places where people have been very good at turning black and brown people, turning women onto these very sciences that don't seem to have a space for them or that they would certainly argue in other contexts, mine at UC San Diego or Vanderbilt, where they would say, there's no space for me here. Then how do those places value graduate uh, folks in those disciplines every year? And some of it is because they have figured out how to center those people's experiences and concerns in the curriculum, not as some side hustle, but as something central to what science looks like for them and their communities. Uh, that's, I, that's great. I, I suspect but, but, we could, uh, as Ariel said, go on for a couple days uh, with these questions. Uh, Ariel, I want to give you the chance if there's uh, any last uh, question you can maybe. Well, there is, so, there is, so there is one question here that could be a good exit question, depending on how you want to end this, Larry. Um, yeah, that'd be you, fine. You sure, sure. So, so, so this is a question by Kate McCord. Um, if the goal is to infuse humanistic knowledge into STEM education, what are the markers of success and how will we know when we've reached mm. them? If when we've reached them. Mm. <laughs> Seems uh, like a good exit the question. Beginning part of that area. Sure, sorry. Um, if the goal is to infuse humanistic knowledge into STEM education, what are the markers of success and how will we know if and when we've reached them? I think that one of the great markers is going off what Richard just said. Once we see some kind of representation in our schools of various groups of people, we will know. You know, most STEM schools in Australia have a representation of maybe, maybe 15 to 20% women. Then you look at senior um, personnel in organizations, again, a representation. Um, how many of them come from underrepresented minority groups? It's, it's, it's one factor, it's one way to measure. But you know, if, if, if schools and universities are talking about changing the emphasis and, and saying, you know, we really respect people, and yet the evidence doesn't show that, we can't attract people, you know, uh, from justice groups or other groups to come and study through scholarships. Why? You know, and so I think once we see better representation across the board, STEM is just not for smart mathematicians. That's a misnomer. Um, once we see more representation across the board, I think uh, we can at least say, right, once we see companies hiring non-STEM students with STEM skills, that's an additional hope, I think, for the future. Once we look at, you know, once we stop the rhetoric that we're all gonna become cyborgs and we start talking about nature and, and, and things that matter, like fires uh, and other disasters, natural disasters that we can perhaps slow down some something with our chemistry or with our knowledge of stem then i think um that's that's a positive way forward i i <laughs> i like that we agree tina right <laughs> uh, uh i think the way that we'll know that we've done this better is exactly what katina said like equity diversion and inclusion will not have to be a process will not have to be a project it will be where we are right uh research I was just looking at this uh, earlier, that a study on attrition from the academy revealed that women leave the academy in greater numbers. I mainly focus on women in STEM um, because they conclude that the characteristics of academic careers 
are unappealing. The impediments they will encounter as women are disproportionate to them and the sacrifices they will have to make are too great. And so much of that, of all three of those things, is a function of science only caring about science in terms of quote unquote foundational knowledge and not caring about being a scientist as something really critical to how science is operating, right? And thinking about like, how do we make being a scientist more appealing to people who have the foundational knowledge and the capability to be a scientist. And so I think like the way that we'll know that we've gotten this better is that students will sit in science classes in their freshman and sophomore years and say, this is a place where I can be me and learn science and be like the person in the front of the room. But until we get to that place, right, where science is just learn the equations, learn the models, people are gonna be as, again, we find out why people say they choose majors, right? They choose majors for instrumental reasons, social reasons, and then expressive reasons, right? It feels like me. I have experiences that have informed this. I can contribute in meaningful ways. If people are coming into science courses and only experience science and never seeing themselves in that space, either in the way science is explained to them or in the way science is applied to the world, then we will lose them. And when we see that we haven't lost them, I think we will have evidence that we have moved past just doing science for science sake. Right. So, if I, so, so we often, um, it's often sort of said or implied that uh, uh, by making science more diverse, we will improve some of these humanistic qualities of what we're doing. You're actually flipping it around, right? You're essentially saying, look, if we want to solve the diversity problem, we need to make science, we need to infuse humanism more into science. That is one of the main ways that we're going to address the diversity problem. And I think right. most STEM faculty don't, don't think about it quite that way. So that's right. powerful. Larry, all yours. Okay, thanks, Ariel. Thanks for that, uh, for channeling the, the Q&A there. Uh, I, I've also looked down through the list. There are many questions we could spend the, the rest of the afternoon on, but, but we're going we're gonna to beg off. First, let me thank our, uh, our panelists, Richard and Katina, for joining us today. This has been fascinating and, and um, I think gives us a really good uh, foundation, not all of the answers of a course, but at least the mindset about how to go in and approach our projects in the future, which I'm hoping as we get near to uh, completion, uh, Richard and Katina, we might impose on you again to, to take, a, take a look at and provide some feedback. It would be marvelous to have you involved in the project that way. Can I just so, say, it's been yeah. a privilege actually to be in this webinar with Richard. Uh, just an absolute privilege. Thank you, Richard, for sharing that with me. Yeah, this, this has been my best thing during COVID to have this conversation <laughs> <laughs> and to have it with Katina, who I didn't know, who's just brilliant. So, so thanks for inviting both of us. Mm. Terrific. Well, thank you both for being here. You both were brilliant. Let me just